basically you can do whatever you want and it's like a blessing and a curse at the same time right because you can in theory design anything uh to support a feature but still there ha are some criteria to that Before we kind of jump into it, can you do like a little intro about yourself? Like, what do you do about your company? Sure. Uh, my name is Elliot Callaghan. I had Unlock Audio. We are an audio co-development studio for game developers, um, primarily AA developers, but we also work with some AAA houses as well. And our aim is to provide the entire audio pipeline for games, um, essentially being a AAA audio department for hire. Um, so my role is um, heading up the company, handling the business aspects of it. When I'm able to get into the work, I write music. I'm a composer, but um, we hover between 12 and 15 people and everyone specializes in a particular facet of audio, just like they do in a AAA audio department. So if sound designers, voice directors, composers, um, audio programming and implementation experts, and then project management support and infrastructure to support all of that. Thank you for finding the time, first of all. Uh, we are a small sound design studio from Warsaw, Poland. Uh, we're crafting sound effects and music, but mostly sound effects or many games. Um, a couple double A platformers, some triple A games that we can talk about, and uh, many indies. So, for like two years now, around two years, uh, we are, you know, getting project after project and trying to figure out uh, what cool sounds we can bring to each game we're working on. Uh, so we are basically like a collaborative bunch of sound designers from all around the world, uh, from Mexico, Turkey, Poland, mm -hmm. joining forces to make sound design for uh, video games, basically. Why does sound matter in games? Like, I think a lot of people are very concentrated on the action or like mechanics or the visuals. And it does not sound like the sound, sorry for the thing, um, that it's uh, taking like the primary seat when we're thinking about priorities when we're developing a game. Uh, give us a little bit of an like understanding of why is it important and why games which don't have sound, ultimately they don't really click. Yeah, I mean, all anyone needs to do is just play any game and turn off the sound and think about how long it takes before they're bored or they're not having fun anymore. Uh, it doesn't take too long. <laughs> um, I mean, sound is what makes everything else feel real and believable and actually elicit a true instinctual response from you. You know, it's the thing that makes you believe the thing that you're seeing. Um, and we're so used to that being done for us that we begin to take it for granted. I think the the um, the double-edged sword of audio and music is, and voice and just everything you hear is that if it's done well, you don't notice, right? But for a lot of the other aspects of game development you're talking about, you know, they have these moments where they you know, a really great accomplishment stands out and that's just the nature of the discipline, right? Um, the nature for audio lots of times is if you've done a really good job, um, people are immediately accepting what you're doing because it's so appropriate for how it's done and how well it matches the visual and the timing and all that sort of stuff. It provides the feel to the game. Um, and that's true emotionally. That's true in terms of a sort of pragmatic or narrative sense. Um, but if you're concerned at all with how someone feels while they're playing your game or what this world is like or how they should be feeling while playing it, um, 
audio is the most direct way in order to influence that, right? And I don't know, when you're playing a game, you're ultimately holding a controller, you're seeing something, and you're hearing something. So I agree that there are a lot of outlets that feel as if audio is maybe not that important, but when it's literally half of the entire experience, um, they really handicap themselves and, I don't know, basically put a lot of time into other efforts of the game or aspects of the game, but then if audio isn't supporting it, you might as well not have even put that time into it. about the um, sound design that that comes out a lot it's um it's one of those things i i think a good comparison would be to like a video game uh, character in a 3d um a video game camera in a third person um a game right so if if the camera is working fine and everything is done properly then you don't really notice it Right. Yeah, it, that's that's, in your way. that's something that uh, I think has been said many times by sound designers before. That if there's no notes for sound, if no one notices it, doesn't even you know give a compliment, then it probably means you did it right. Uh, it's also not true, of course, but. Yeah, if it's like unnoticeable and you just buy it, no questions asked, then it's probably, uh, that probably means you're at least doing it good enough. Yeah, that's a, that's actually in one of the things that I keep coming back because we work with a lot of, um, you know, environment artists and uh, they do build their own demos. Like they, they build like a demo of the scene that they're working on. It's more often than not it's silent so it's kind of like just kind of like a reel of what i've done and so on but um if you add a little bit of an extra layer of some sound like even like if it's very ambient and it's not really jumping out of the you know out of the screen it it is a completely different experience it yeah. it is not just like a you know it's not just like a, a thing that you know, makes it a little bit better. It's the thing that completely revamps it. And when I think about kind of like big games that are memorable, and and this is something that goes way back, like in like nostalgia's um, territory, right? Uh, you do feel like music plays a very big part there. So it's like if you look at the title screen of uh, you know Elden Ring where it kind of bombards you with these trumpets and like a like a wall of this sound that is kind of worrying like into what you're getting. Basically, we brainstorm where sound is going to put in effort to support gameplay because that's basically what needs to happen. I would say that uh, the, the biggest the coolest thing a sound design in in a game can do is basically support gameplay and uh, bring out the best in what game has in game mechanics. I mean, sometimes sound can also be like a mechanic uh, of its own, uh, and there are very cool examples of that uh, being implemented in games as well. But I would say that the coolest thing is uh, if the sound like really contributes to to whatever the game tries to achieve, right? So, so yeah, the, the process starts basically almost always with with a brainstorm on. on but what, it, it, you know, and I think this is one defining difference between say like film and animation and games is lots of times. Um, we're having to create audio and sound and music for something that there's not sort of a frame of reference for, or at least not a complete frame of reference. You know, if you see a film, 
and people are walking down the sidewalk, we have expectations for what that sounds like. We've all walked on sidewalks. We've all seen people walking. Um, there's a lot of expectations that we need to, to meet, right? But when we're talking about games and animation and whatnot, you know, things can just be out there. And we may be creating sound or audio for things that have never existed, that no one's even seen before, really. And then, you know, for us to take something that no one has any frame of reference for, and then we create audio and sound for it, and then the immediate response is, oh yeah, obviously, that's what that sounds like, you know? And if you you get that, or you're getting someone to say, obviously, that's what this thing that I've never seen before that I've never heard before, that I have no idea how this thing exists. Obviously, that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, like that's an incredible moment. But because of the nature of that, um, it doesn't really stand out so much because obviously this just works. But what, this is like an excellent point. Like, How do you design a sound for something that does not exist? And this happens in games all the time, not only with sound, but anything like a design or materials or movement or any part of it. Um, when you're, when you're doing this, I know like in other areas, people often think about anal in analogies. So let's say if it's a, if it's a robot, but it looks like a T-Rex, it, it might as well growl or something like that. Do you think in the same terms when you are approaching these design choices or do you have some other idea and so on. And if you could give some examples, it would be amazing. Uh, I mean, I think in the realm of sound, you're absolutely thinking about material. You're absolutely thinking about shape. And um, there's this idea of audio um, called ADSR, which stands for attack to K, sustain release. And if you get into music synthesis using synthesizers, or if you're getting very granular in terms of audio discussions, ADSR comes up a lot um, because it gives us a way to talk about the specific shape of a sound when we're talking about very small increments of time. Like when we have an idea for how a sound begins, right? Does it just start or does it slowly fade in? Um, that's going to change the amount of time and the shape for the attack of that sound. Um, as opposed to how does this sound end? Does it slowly decay away? Does it suddenly cut off? Does something else happen? What moment in the sound does it happen? So ADSR plays a big role in us being able to craft something that goes along with, say, movement of any um, action or event that we're trying to create a sound for, right? Um, we may want to draw more attention towards the beginning of a sound. We may want to draw more attention towards the end. How do we do that? Um, are there differences in materials during that time? Um, is there also a different sort of emotional connotation with any part of this as well? Like, is the intent behind this to make the player feel a certain way about this? Um, and, you know, there, there could be a number of other different things that are so specific to that one project about wanting to imbue a certain style as well. So I'd say, um, you know, material sh and shape and sort of like emotional intent are really the three um, primary things that I think of as a sound designer. Um, I think there are many more things that you could think of, um, but I, I would imagine that for a lot of other disciplines, there's something similar to that too. It's just that their lens and those sort of three things for them are going to be different. I think that for sure there are analogies, right? And many of them, because there have been so many uh, media created over the last century uh, that we that we know how they sound, that we kind of expect many things, right? And uh, Obviously, like when you press a button, you kind of expect it to go like, or something like that. And there are many, many tropes in sound. Some of them are uh, used uh, and all the time and being like beloved by sound designers and 
some of them are used so often that they became jokes in sound design and people try to like use it comedically or get away from them. Um, and also it's style. What about, what, what are those jokes? Oh, for example, the most, uh, well known is, uh, Wilhelm scream from movies. It's a sample of a voice, I think, sampled from a like an old American TV show. And it's a sample of a guy falling down, I would say. So it has been used in many, many films and TV shows since. And it's this one recording of a guy going like, ah! and, and right now it's just being used as a joke. Uh, for example, in the once upon a time in Hollywood, when they mm, shoot like Rick Dalton on the uh, set of uh, Bounty Law or whatever that show that he was in was called, there is a guy falling out the window. And of course, they used that <laughs> scream for him being thrown out the window. And it's been in Star Wars, in Indiana Jones, and in so many films ever since. <laughs> But from, you know, a certain point in time, people started putting it inside of movies just to have fun making movies. It's like a very short piece of audio and who notices will kind of smile. Some people will not smile anymore because they think it's like already been used as a joke so many times that it's stupid. Uh, but there are other examples. There is a duck called a uh, loon. It's a Canadian duck, I think. And it makes like a, like a lone noise. I don't know if I can recreate it with my mouth, but it's like a. <laughs> type of thing. And it's used in every movie almost when it's a desolate place, which is funny because you know, in Marvel movies, it's been used as a, when you are on a different planet, right? Sometimes it's being even used like on the desert, even though on the desert there are no ducks whatsoever. There's even a fall video on YouTube from Vox channel about this one sound. And they are complaining that some designers use this sound, uh, neglecting the, uh, environmental aspect of, you know, there are no ducks on the desert or something. And I don't know about the desert. For example, there is a, like, there is an expectations, there is an expectation created by games and movies that on the desert you hear wind basically, right? Like howling desert wind. There is no wind like that on the desert. I think Mark Mangini, the sound designer for that received two uh, Academy Awards, talks about it um, when he talks about the uh, sound design for Doom, that they like hated this trope of wind in the desert and they like completely, uh, they banned it from their own film and they, uh, tried to use like a new sound vocabulary for the desert because they hated this trope so much because it's like inaccurate and doesn't bring anything interesting in their opinion to the, to the desert environment. So yeah, there are expectations, like many, many expectations. Like you kind of expect the monster to sound like, ah, I'm scary, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many expectations. Uh, and also there is. I would say experimentation mm -hmm. because like you can allow yourself to, if the project is stylized, for example, we're working on a 3D platformer called, called Bang on Balls. And this game is like a very stylized game. And basically the main character is a ball. So mm -hmm. this gives us like amazing 
amounts of freedom in sound creation. Basically, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and it's like a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? Because you can, in theory, design anything uh, to support a feature. But um, still, there ha are some criteria to that. Like, for example, it has to be funny. Overall, like when people are thinking about sound design, like w what does it mean? Like, I, I feel like everybody might seem to have this picture of, you know, like in, I think it was one of the Indiana Jones films was well, the one with Sean Connery where they have rats in the sewers and mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 they have a very peculiar sound. And then at the end, they figured out that the, to record that sound, you, you don't really need rats you need the uh, chickens and they, they went out to the farm and they recorded how chickens sound and the, that's kind of like how sound uh, of that particular moment was born so in terms of you as a sound designer how do you kind of start working on that do you think in the same kind of like idea that you have a particular sound in your hand when you think about a particular function or is there like a bigger process and yeah, well, I think when you're talking about interactive mediums that you, depending on the asset itself, the sound itself, the music itself, um, lots of times you have to think about the implementation system that's going to be used for it and or how this uh, asset or sound might need to change depending on different parameters or progression or whatever it is. Like you may have one sound that you hear, but it may have, five different layers that are added or subtracted or are louder or quieter or processed differently depending on different parameters or things in the game. So that's one thing to think of. Um, but beyond that, I think it's categorizing them by things such as environment, by player, by weapons, by foley and character sounds. And you have to sort of pick a path or a lens in which you're looking through in order to help you really think about what all the different needs are. If you just randomly say, I just need sounds for this, um, that's just way too broad. But the moment that you hone in and you say, well, what is this particular character? If I'm just around this character, what am I going to hear? Or if I was actually interacting with this sort of UI, what would be all of the moments that I'd want to accentuate or draw attention to with it, right? So um, I think it starts with any sort of implementation system, and then you think about the specific category or grouping, and then that helps you formulate, I guess, the the process or the next steps in terms of what you're going to do and how you're going to approach the sound. I no longer wish to remember. You, you kind of touched about this um, thing a little bit when you said like you were, you have a menu items and the sound can help you kind of accentuate some of them and so on. And my question is like, what does the, what does a good sound do? Like it, it, it is this something that just kind of like a little bit, you know, adding color somewhere, you know, driving your attention or, or is this something that should be kind of like on the back? and shouldn't interfere with the, uh, you know, with the gameplay and so on. I, I'm, I'm like, um, I, I feel like building a sound that is constantly repeating in a game is very challenging because this is something that you hear all the time. And it's kind of like, if you, A, it should not irritate you and B, it should be kind of specific, but at the same time, it should not take your attention away from the gameplay. And um, when I'm thinking about this, I think about this 
the sound with which um, this flying X in God of War returns into Kratos' hands. It's like it's this satisfying thump, like when it's you know back in your. Um, I think that works very well, and you can play it for you know <laughs> because it's part of the fighting system. You hear it constantly, and it never it is never in a way. So I'm wondering. What's your approach there? How do you look at this problem? And uh, what are like the solutions that allow you to kind of build these sounds that are working for games? Got it. Well, I I think it demands a conversation with the design director or creative lead because I think there are absolutely times when the UI or sound should distract the player from gameplay. Absolutely. But it needs to fit in with the overall vision and and to know that that's the intent for that moment with the design of the game. Um, but, uh, you know, depending on what their intents are, um, so I teach a couple courses at DePaul University here in, in game sound and music, and there's half of one class where all we do is talk about menus and UI interactions. And um, a couple of the games that I show clips from, one of them is Bioshock Infinite, just this area where you've killed all the enemies and you're just walking around looting a ton of things and we think about the fact that all of the sounds that they're using don't communicate a sort of number of items they just communicate sort of this grouping or general category of sounds but they all do it in a way where it's specific to the time period so it reinforces the environment the time setting it communicates necessary information, but it's also not giving you information overload because if, say, you were looting all of these items and you were in the middle of combat, um, is it really that important that you know you picked up nine bullets as opposed to six? Or do you just need to know, I've picked up something and I can you know use this weapon again, right? As opposed to like Papers, Please, where, you know, that that is so sparse in every almost every single way outside of the story and that adds to the monotony and it adds to the dehumanization of everyone that's there and it adds to you understanding the experience of being that employee and being sort of i guess like that bored or apathetic about all of this stuff right but that's that's very much the intent of that at the time so in terms of UI sounds and sound design, it can do a number of different things. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not that fits in with the overall creative division, um, vision, but that's a conversation that needs to happen. In terms of avoiding ear fatigue, like you're talking about, where you hear the same sound a lot of times over and over, and you want to know that that's not going to get annoying to people. Um, yeah, I mean, first off, yeah, make a good sound. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about theory and the intent and implementation systems and all these things but there's absolutely an aspect of some sounds are just good and sound better um and you really have to be very specific and craft something so that no portions of the frequency spectrum really stick out too much so you avoid that ear fatigue um but then there's also uh the aspect of the overall mix you know maybe moving other things out of the way or maybe not depending on where you want the player's focus to be um, and then there's other aspects in terms of implementation, like randomization of pitch playback. If you hear it a lot in quick succession, you can play the same sound, but just slightly bend the pitch of it up, down, and whatnot, and give a range of um, how much you want to alter it in real time, just so if you hear it over and over again, it's not going to be the exact same sound every time. So there's a number of different ways that you can have the same sound, hear it a lot, not sort of get annoyed with it. Good to see you again, fellow explorer. You won't believe it, but I finally found him. Yeah, Big Mo, the real owl. Yeah, that's what a bite from Mo would feel like. <laughs> yeah, why don't you hang on to this? Think it's one of his eggs, but you can handle yourself. We talked a little bit about, um, and thank you for your kind of like input. I do feel like, you know, you don't, 
you really try to have, you want to have some originality when the, it, it comes to music and sound. And uh, when I'm thinking about kind of like good examples of this, I always think about, uh, especially in film, in games, it's very easy. It's like you go to, <clears throat> you know, like games like Guitar Hero or, you know, a lot of those rhythm based games, which are kind of based on, on music. But in film, I think one of the directors that really uh, stands out is um, Edgar Wright, uh, and he did a lot. He did he did movies like uh, you know, John something something zombie you blah 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 and uh, Baby Driver like uh, Baby oh, Driver this guy Scott Pilgrim yeah. versus the world yeah Scott Pilgrim and all those others and Scott Pilgrim is also a great example but. Like in his movies, um, it's like he really plays with the form and like music there. It's not just kind of like something that you don't notice. It's just something that is really part of the story, part of the uh, storytelling as well and kind of part of the character. And it's like it's very visual, it's impactful. And when you're looking at this and you're, it's like this, it's really like a 3D, 4D experience, 5D experience where every sense is being attacked at the same time and you have this kind of like a fuller uh, exploration. And um, my question to you is like, when you think about games outside of like the Guitar Hero and kind of like traditional uh, examples, um, what are great examples of uh, very good sound design in games? Like wh what really stands out to you Oh man, there are so many, and uh, I think there are so many in many different. Uh, many games achieve many different things in sound. That's what I think, and um, but I love the Edgar Wright example that you gave because he, what he does is super stylized, and every film, like uh, every soundtrack is very much tied with the film, right? And I think the games that kind of do the same thing are the ones I like the most. And because many games, um, they tend to, you know, sound realistic. They, many sound in the games, many games in general, they kind of just sound like what you expect from them to sound. But some of them achieve to like go step a step beyond and reach greatness. Um, I think an ex a great example is Halo series. Like uh, all the sound effects in those games were crafted by the game team themselves. I think they rarely used any like sound libraries. Uh, all the like laser weapon sounds, they are a result of uh, experimentation and creativity. There are amazing videos on YouTube of sound designers from Halo. Right now I'm just building sounds mostly for uh, the new Forerunner vehicle, the VTOL, and um, also uh, different visual effects for Forerunner characters, a warden and soldier. So I'm just trying to get these kind of like glitchy, kind of zippy elements that I could kind of mix in with all these different animations of their little bits and pieces breaking apart, forming back together. This is the Eurorack format. It's uh, basically just a modular synthesizer and you can pick and choose all the little different, different pieces of hardware and kind of form your own instrument. I'd basically just have a little mason jar with two magnets basically uh, tracking to each other. And that way I can just kind of move this along and kind of get these nice little interesting textures of the, of the actual magnet sliding against the little ridges of the glass and kind of get all these nice little glitchy actions going. like uh, getting crazy sounds from like modular synthesizers and recording them 
saying basically like, this is why Halo sounds great because this is like our original thing we're doing and no one else has this. So yeah, I think Halo as a whole series is just a great example of, of amazing sound design. Like the weapons in that game sound stellar and very original. Um, I think the other game that is stylized and um, and sounds amazing is um, Cuphead. It's a super simple, uh, like it's not the AAA title with many, many, many sounds, right? But I think this game is like straight up brave because what they did is like every everything in the game sounds like from a old speaker first of all, right? I think the character actually snaps its fingers in Cuphead to produce like a blue projectile, and what they did is they just used a, a snapping sound, and when it snaps in a loop, it's very characteristic. It suits the gameplay perfectly. Um, and it's contributing to to the whole um, to the whole style of Cuphead. Um, again, that sound could have been anything. It could have been like a mag magical projectile being shot. But they picked something so basic that suits the character. Uh, sometimes the simplest idea is the hardest to find, but I think they nailed it. So, uh, and it's amazing. Like it's a bold decision to, to do this kind of thing. Um, One cool example of uh, sound supporting a feature in the game is a game called Elite, Elite Dangerous. It, you can blow up asteroids basically in this game and you put on charges and you can hear every single charge uh, um, blowing up. Detonation in ten seconds. And then there is like a seismic visual effects that uh, that breaks the, the asteroid and it reaches the spaceship delayed. So it goes like boom and then it spreads and then the whole ship shakes. What's very cool is that the spaceship has like a voice assistant, like Jarvis from um, Iron Man. And the voice that um, lets you know that uh, there's been damage done to the ship is like distorted and glitched, which helps to invoke, you know, the feeling of uh, basically force that this uh, explosion had, which is a very cool way to, you know, add to the to the scene uh, something more than just like a one gigantic explosion. The whole rattling of the spaceship and the voice assistant going like. <laughs> was uh, was a very cool idea, in my opinion. Other example of a stylized game would be, uh, for example, Inside. That game had amazing sounds. Um, and I think this is like, Inside is a, apart from being like very, uh, very stylized, is also cool because um, the sound is used like a very, it's very tactile. Uh, there is a scene in Inside where there are, there are like moving platforms 
that you need to follow with the player and there are shock waves coming at you. And those shock waves, they have like a gigantic ramp up. And then the the impact is doesn't sound like a, you know, doesn't sound like an explosion, like in many games it would. It doesn't sound like a shotgun being fired or a cannon slowed down. This impact is like a like a synthesizer bram kind of noise so there is like a ramp up that goes like then there is like a tiny bit of silence and then the impact is like wow which is amazing because this is like exactly not doing what's expected but doing something very stylized that's even better than what you expect for me this is like the best thing that can happen in games yeah I think you mentioned there this thing it's kind of like subverting your expectations yeah and playing around with what do you expect uh is going to happen and doing something different it's like as if you were given this example about monsters and how they sound and if it's like you know a very huge monster and it would sound like a chicken or something yeah uh, it, you know what i mean i i think a, a, a great example of that would be when, when when you take something that is like very traditional and you make it completely different and uh, there was this game I think it was Rick and Morty uh, creator uh, uh, yeah high, high, I still right? need to play that game I still need to play it I haven't played it as well but it's, but it's such a fun concept where you have a gun and the gun talks yeah. so like your, your gun you're kind of like interacting with a gun and usually in our uh, perception gun is something like super mechanical it's like you're really not um you know really not something that you interact with and when when you're when you were talking about these examples i was also thinking about uh portal one and portal two yeah um, classic yeah th that those games have and overall kind of like valve games they have a certain kind of like i, I would also o almost say a sound signature that yeah, they have you can really read through that sound, meaning that it's uh, it is trying to be realistic, but at the same time, it's kind of humorous in a way, and it's like even like how you in the in the, in that um, facility where you're like w when like all, all the sounds they they sound kind of very corporate almost, you know yeah. what I mean? They're like very kind of like what you would expect in the, like a research facility. And uh, then it clashes with this, uh, you know, a AI intelligence and how you fight with it and like there are different robots and how they sound and how they sound human. But at the same time, they have the, these robotic qualities and how they work with actors in, in general and kind of like all those other uh, elements. It's just like it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating way to explore uh, games in general when you're looking at them from kind of like from a sound uh, perspective. I'm, I'm also wondering, like we've been talking a lot about sounds and I'm interested in uh, learning how do how do these get produced today? So is this still very much an analog process or is this more of like a digital kind of like remastering in this uh, widgets and so on like where do you stand there like how are both kind of like elements work together today yeah i mean there's no way that you have to or you should not create a sound or create sounds outside of i guess uh legal considerations really um i think you can create some incredible sounds if you don't record anything new and you use a number of pre-existing assets that you have you fit them together, you balance them well, you mix them and you create the thing that you actually want. 
that being said, um, if your goal is to have something truly unique, um, one of the best ways to do that is by creating ingredients that no one else has, right? So if you truly want to um, make something that has no semblance to something else that's been created already, even if it's the same category, um, yeah, then you need to go out and you need to record your own assets and create your own libraries. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do is a, a mix of all that. Um, lots of times we'll take libraries that are commercially available. We may even combine them with recordings that are in our own personal and company libraries, just sounds that we've recorded over the years. Uh, we may create something or make have some recording sessions for new assets that we use for that project. Um, and there's also a lot of synthesis used as well. Um, uh, depending on the genre of the title and just the type of aesthetic you're going for, um, we use synthesizers and analog hardware a lot um, layered within real actual recordings of, I guess, physical actions and uh, events taking place um, just to give it that sense of drama, to make it more satisfying and to kind of imbue the, the I guess, style and aesthetic that we're going for. So I know it's kind of a cop-out answer, but um, yes to all of the above. <laughs> so when... When we think about sound and uh, sound design, um, a lot of people are saying, okay, so why don't I just do it myself? You know, there are a, a bunch of libraries out there. You can, first of all, you can download just free stuff somewhere, right? Then you can subscribe to some services and get, you know, music, you can get like, you know, sound libraries, whatever it's pretty robust and there's like a ton of businesses we're not going to advertise them here but just i think it's all out there um the question is like what are like the advantages of these pre-made remastered uh bits that you can use take from the shelf uh and what are the advantages of just kind of like going to a specialist and uh, trying to craft something uh for that is entirely bespoke for your particular project. Yeah. Well, I think if resources are limited, that a lot of those libraries and other resources are absolutely great options to take a look at. If nothing else, it significantly raises the floor of how your game is going to be perceived. Um, even if you don't have a sound that's the most appropriate, um, it at least won't come off as utterly completely amateurish. So I think that that's absolutely something to consider if you're um, if you're limited on funds and resources. Um, but it also comes down to the end experience and what you want to actually create and how specific and also unique you want to make something as well. Um, you know, there are opportunities if you're willing to talk to a sound designer about your intent in certain moments and stylistic goals and whatnot that they can begin to design around. Um, especially if you get into implementation systems and altering things in real time based on what's occurring in game, like a lot of those assets, it's going to be really difficult to sort of find that in libraries that are out there. Um, and, you know, if you just make a game that uh, you know, you, you can get a ton of pre-made assets for visuals as well as things that are audio. And at a certain point, how much are you really making a game as opposed to putting a patchwork together of other things that weren't meant to go together? And if you just like kind of jam them together, um, you might get lucky once in a while, but it's going to be difficult to find the same level of synergy and um, a lot more difficult to create a sense of you know, the end result being greater than the sum of its parts. Um, those parts need to be conducive to each other and help support the actual vision of the developer in terms of how they come together. Um, so yeah, if it's about specificity and it's also about speed too, you know, you might have just a ton of assets that are available, but if you care about making something that truly works for the experience, it's going to be a lot harder than just, oh, I just buy this library, throw it in the game, and it 
works. It's going to take some time and massaging on your end, um, not even from a stylistic standpoint, from just but from a logistical. How is this shape? How is the shape of this sound um, relating to what I'm using it for? Does it need to be short, shortened, or lengthened? Does it need to start at a certain point through it? Um, so I think a lot of people have a misconception of I buy a library and then I just don't have to worry about it. It's like, no, it's still a fair amount of work to just do that. And unless you have years of experience working with audio tools, um, it's still going to be a pretty big time commitment. Question I often ask to people who work with sound, especially uh, composers, and something that has also been um, touched by many YouTube channels in, including the uh, every frame of painting so the wonderful channel and unfortunately i think now it's uh, a little bit um it, it's not being developed but the 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 question is of uh temp music so kind of like the temporary music that you put uh in in a game or a film and so on and it's um it, it's sort of like in my uh, thinking this is something that really uh, hurts imagination and creativity where you kind of give them something that, and you get something that sounds very much the same. So it's like not really interesting and uh, it's not really original. There's like no melody. And it's like this very kind of like ambient, almost like elevator, elevator kind of um, sound. And um, how do how do you, as sound designers and composers, how do you feel about it? Like, and what are you trying to do when you're in this situation when you're there kind of giving you, you know, an example, and they want you to repeat the same thing. Like, is there some move uh, maneuver there or, or not? Or so? I had, uh, um, I guess I've been lucky enough not to ever worked with any temp music, uh, ever in my life, mm. at least not in a scenario where someone used the temp, temp music and uh, expected me to mm. deliver something similar. I mean, I think it's just a matter of mm. understanding that temp music should be used in a certain way. I think there is nothing wrong with editing to temp music or like, uh, you know, having temp music because you feel like this type of music kind of represents what you want to, uh, the feel of the scene or the feel of the moment in the game, right? But I think it's just a matter of not expecting a composer in the future to follow that tent music, uh, period. <laughs> um, because, as you said, I, it definitely kills creativity. And I, I've seen movies, uh, I kind of lack examples right now, but I recall scenes from mu movies where I uh, hear what has been composed and I'm thinking, oh, this was edited to a song that I know. And the song that has been composed is kind of similar to the hit song I know. Not quite the same thing, but resembles the original. And I don't know, maybe not many people notice that, but if you do, it can probably ruin the scene for you because you start thinking about this and not the scene. Uh, but I, I'm not against using it at all. I think it kind of can help and make uh, time playing faster. But you know, it has to be, I think, just agreed at the beginning that uh, this is just for, you know, synchronization or tempo or just a feel. And the the composer is not obligated to to follow it to the bone. Like, it, he has to have its own, his own uh, or their own creativity. And, like, without it, they're just going to deliver like a bad piece of music or the one that just resembles the original and then sounds kind of weird. I'm wondering if you could kind of guide us as to 
how do you maybe help your clients professionally making sure that the music in the game is going to play well, it's going to make sense, and it's going to create those emotions that you were talking about in the previous um, answer. Sure. Well, I personally feel that you have to start with the intent of the creative lead as well as create a structure in terms of the implementation system for, if we're talking about music specifically, um, for music. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of folks that say know how to write music and aren't aware of the technical constraints and opportunities for the medium of games. And because of that, they're not thinking about how they need to construct construct these systems or the ways that they could construct them, how you can trans transition between different assets, what aspects of gameplay or the world or the narrative or the whatever it happens to be can be accentuated with interactive music systems, vertical remixing, horizontal, different middleware opportunities. Um, so there's a significant barrier just off the bat to understand what's possible, just what the possibilities are, um, even before we begin talking about the actual aesthetic and artistically and creatively what we're going to create, right? Um, so I think there needs to be a large conversation about that, sort of an education process that needs to happen between someone who's handling music for a project and the other stakeholders in it. And then after that, once you have a general structure and understand the different things that you want to play off of that can reinforce the vision of the creative director, um, then I, I think it moves into the phase of, well, let's actually figure out this aesthetic and um, let's look at past references of titles that you really like and enjoy and let's ask some prodding questions that force you to articulate why you think something is good. If you haven't interacted with audio people before or composers, um, it can be difficult to talk about sound music and audio if you're not used to it. I teach a couple courses here at DePaul and, um, you know, a lot of them start using terms like low or high or rough. And depending on what you're talking about, those can all mean very different things. So it's honing in on exactly what you're trying to communicate. And it'd be great if we could have someone take an entire course on game audio, but when you don't have the time to do that, um, the next best thing is to have a reference, hit play, and then let them use the words that come naturally to them, because then you're able to understand how they're using those words and what that relates to in terms of their examples. And you develop a vocabulary between you and the creative director so you can both get on the same page and begin to figure this out. But yeah, once you know the implementation structure and opportunities, once you develop that vocabulary and understand the type of aesthetic you're going for, then it just becomes a regular back and forth of, you know, what are your intentions during the sequence of gameplay? What are your priorities? What's important? And then you create the actual assets themselves to fit within these systems and these stylistic guides that you've created together. If you're, um, if you have this opportunity to talk to kind of like an imaginary client, uh, and kind of like give him advice on how to work with a sound designer, what would that advice be? Like, how would you recommend approaching communicating with a sound designer and kind of like, what are the most important things that you need? To That's a good question. I I need to think what helped me the most, I guess, when I was talking with my clients. I would say, um, okay, so in Bang on Balls, in one of the first meetings we had, uh, the, the game director, he said that they want... Mm -hmm voices in the game and there has been no voices in the game at all when we started doing this project we kind of took over 
the previous sound designer had to jump to a bigger project and then we started doing things on those like a quarter of first map and so they said like the problem is that in Bang on Balls there was uh, going to be many many countries because it's a country ball game so we knew there was going to be uh, Great Britain uh, Russia uh, United States uh, Japan Nordic countries Hispanic countries we knew all of those uh, types of characters are going to be in the game but like we didn't feel that recording uh, lines in every language would be like funny enough for this game so the game director he basically showed me a video of a Muppet sketch called Swedish Chef and basically this is a Muppet that's making meatballs from Sweden and he's just like this Muppet is just like a and making fun of Swedish language and this basically became like a framework for all of the voices in the game so basically every single country we just kind of make fun of this country creating complete gibberish that doesn't mean anything that just sounds like a certain language right so I think and I'm just telling this story because I think it was a very good idea it worked great in the game but the initial uh, initial thing that kick started it was this Swedish chef example so I guess a good tip for any director is to try to inspire his sound designers when they start working with him by having uh, maybe not a vision for a set uh, audio feature or how a certain sound effect should sound like but uh, having cool references to what they like I think uh, this is the very telling message because you can follow this reference or don't but a reference is usually a good thing to talk about and bounce things off right and yeah I think that's a worthy tip so Alan kind of like the last rounding question uh, for our users and for our viewers uh, who are either developing a game or maybe they're developing um, a scene maybe they're trying to get you know uh, a prototype going or something like that what are like the three main things in terms of design of sound that they need to make a priority if they want their project to work I think the definitely a big thing is just to think of the environment and the ambiance I think that there are a lot of people out there who just get some like 20 or 30 second loop and forget about it but to create a sense of an environment that's really interesting um there's going to be no just singular loop that you can get that really does that we spend a lot of time on the ambiances that we, we create we had just small moments of interest and small events like there was a large sort of ice snow area that we had and you could just have the general room tone of the environment but then to have moments where the wind comes in and out to have moments where you could hear these um, large snow hills like some ice falling and breaking in the distance and adding all those small little moments in there um, I mean that that adds life to it and makes it actually believable and engaging so I would say ambience and environments spend some time in them um, additionally I'd also spend some time thinking about hierarchy and what's really the most important in terms of just you know the world you're creating and or the information that you want to create for the player um like especially if you're doing something like a first person shooter um you know the hierarchies that they create there are not realistic 
um, in most ways, right? You're prioritizing a lot of audio cues and information so that you tell the player what they want um, because they've figured out and realized that's what needs to happen for this type of gameplay. So I would take a second and really think about what that is for your game to make sure that you're creating a hierarchy that keeps the player focused on what exactly you want them to focus on um, and gives them the information that they need in an effective way that still sounds good, fun, and engaging. Um, and then the last piece of it, I'd say overall for sound. Um, I would say, I'd say, you know, spend some time thinking about the implementation of all of this stuff. Um, one of the reasons why I think a lot of people say, oh, I can just buy a library is because they don't know all of the capabilities and possibilities of game engines and audio middleware and all the ways that that can make the experience better. Um, you know, we've already talked um, about using one sound that you hear a lot repeatedly in ways to avoid ear fatigue, right? Um, but each sound that you hear, you could have four or five different audio assets that are all being triggered, all of them could have a certain level of randomization. All of them could change depending on different selections or moments in the game. And to not think about that and think about the possibilities for your game is a huge missed opportunity you know, and just a way to stand out that you're not taking advantage of. Thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, great talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of give us some comments. And um, we'll add the links to your studio description in the comments to the YouTube so people can check it out, click. Maybe they'll find it interesting and, you know, they try to work with you or so on. And uh, just kind of like hear your story. It was interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thanks so much for, for chatting with me. Thanks for enjoying another episode of the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. Check out upcoming episodes on the 80 Level website at 80.lv. Join our career site at 80.lv slash RFP. And share our podcast with friends and on your social networks.